Hey guys, as some of you know, last month I actually sold my marketing agency to another agency in the orthodontic space called Hip Creative. Hip has been around for about eight years and last month they did $800,000 in revenue, which is absolutely mind boggling for a niche marketing agency. So once the transaction was complete, I knew I had to sit down with Luke, one of the co-founders at Hip, and get the scoop on how they had built something so successful. So he was gracious enough to answer every single question I had and you guys get to listen in, which is priceless. So let's roll. I found this quote a couple years ago that really resonated with how we first grew the agency, started the agency, and I'm paraphrasing, but it's something like, unless you can keep the clients you have, you don't have a real business. And that was really the center point of me and Justin, the other co-founder at HIP, just our, our philosophy and the way we did business. Early on, we didn't understand sales, the you know sales process that a lot of people teach today and a lot of people integrate into their agencies or coaching businesses, uh, consulting, what have you. We didn't really understand any of that. Mm. All we understood was really kind of how to sell ourselves and stand behind really quality work. And so when we started the first probably four years, we didn't even really have a sales process. You know, it was really digging into people's businesses, trying to understand as much as we could, and then explaining to them how marketing could help and uh, getting way too much into the weeds probably. Like we would talk about in-depth SEO and, you know, all these different searches and, you know, here's content campaigns we could roll out and just like a lot of information. Um, but for us, you know, we knew we were going to be able to deliver on that and stand behind it. And the product was really good. You know what I mean? So we really just focused on the product and organic growth. And back then it was, you know, one by one, like, if we can just get one more client, okay, if we can do really well for this guy and build a case study, he's going to tell two, three, four more people. And it just, that's how it was. Hmm. And we really kind of obsessed over the product and over the, the customer service aspect. You know, if somebody emailed us, I mean, you can ask my wife, like, I'd respond back at like 11 p.m. Hmm. You know, I remember taking a sales call on Christmas Eve with somebody and like stepping out on my back patio. And I'm not saying those things were good, um, but there was always an urgency for the customer and for their needs. And we wanted to, you know, be able to just always be available and just have amazing service. And this is kind of a, a long answer to your question, but to go all the way back how I was trained early on in my professional career was Chick-fil-A. Mm. And it's like at Chick-fil-A, the customer's always right. We're going to find a way to make this work. We're, you know, during our hours, we're always going to be there responsive as fast as we possibly can. There was just a lot of urgency. I remember this one guy came back after a big Chick-fil-A type of event, and they printed out this one word, and slapped it on paper all over all the doors and windows, and it was uh, Sa'u. And all it meant was sense of urgency. And that was just ingrained in the culture. And I think, you know, if you know Chick-fil-A, it still is today. That just stuck with me, you know, because convenience is so important to people. Hmm. And what I see a lot of the way the agencies run their business or just any type of business is they really forget that. Mm. And it's like, you know, they may have a good product, they may do a good job or have good case studies, but if the customer doesn't have a good experience, they're gonna find somewhere else to go. And so that was just really important for us. Uh, I think it's something that you know, if you even go read the five-star reviews on HIP on uh, Google My Business, a lot of them are about that. Just, hey, they get back to you super quick, and they're always there, and they're always responsive. And, you know, obviously, you have to be careful with that, one, for your time, you know, and as you have a family, and two, your team. You can't require your team to, like, 
be online at 10 p.m., but we can create processes and systems to make it easier. So, you know, for business owners, I would really encourage them to stop thinking so much about sales and think more about quality and the product and the relationships. That's another thing that was really big for us is like that one client I was talking about who could refer us like, I was going to offer the best professional relationship to that person. And many of those people I'm still friends with today. Mm. Um, And so I think that's really important to get to know your customer, Mm. obsess over their business, get to know it inside and out and maybe not offer things for free, you know, and just like deplete yourself. But I, I think it really can help a lot of people just to understand business more. Um, Because I think that's specifically, if we're talking about agency owners, that's a big missing link. And that's why sometimes it's hard to further connect the marketing to grow the business. Is if you only understand Facebook or SEO, it's only going to go so far. Yeah. So, yeah. um, You know, fast forward to today. Sales, as you know, is a big part of our business. And it, it took a long time for us to build a sales process for me to understand sales for a long time. I was the only salesperson um, brought in Harrison and brought in Melissa and, you know, our sales process isn't perfect, but it's pretty good. Mm. And it's something that's more predictable. Now I would say once you're at that point and ready to scale sales and sales, isn't going to like break the company every month, you know, Um, Because again, I really think focus on the product first and sales are going to come. But once you're at that point, for me, uh, my philosophy was omnipresence. I think as digital marketers, we can pigeonhole ourselves and like, oh, we're just going to run Facebook ads. And that's great. But what if you could run Facebook ads and be in front of your audience? What if you could be speaking at the event they're going to go to that month, the next month, four or five times a year? What if you could send them direct mail? What if you could be in front of them when they're on ESPN, when they Google something, go to YouTube? And so that's my goal now is I just want to be everywhere, you know, because that's how you build the household name. And if you have the quality and product to back it up, I think it becomes more real because I know people who just run ads and I'll go speak at all the events or Harrison and like, you know, there's a difference when somebody's in front of you, Mm. you know? And so why would you only run ads if you can do all these other things and be in the same location and in front of them and speaking on stage, it just becomes a lot more real, I think. And I wouldn't just focus on a single channel to grow your business. Very cool. How did you get your first client? The very first client I ever had, I think, was a jeweler. And I helped a friend uh, in a local p- capacity, uh, probably when I was like 18, 19, 20, and that ended. And I just walked in and said, hey, guys, if you you want help continuing to grow your, your business, I'll help you. What's funny is they said yes, and I remember they paid me $300 a month for an email newsletter. Nice. And I wasn't even using something like MailChimp. It was, like, far worse than that. <laughs> and, like, back then, that would, like, generate sales. People yeah. would come in and be like, oh, yeah, I saw that in the newsletter, you know, and either they would buy that piece or it would lead to showing them different pieces and they would buy it. Um, I still work for that jeweler today, so I've worked with them for about 16 years And I'm not just doing emails, (laughs) you know, Um, but it's funny to think back and back then that was like, and I think obviously email campaigns can still be dynamic and a big thing. But back then it's like, that's all I did. Mm. Um, So, yeah, it's pretty, pretty interesting. You got the jeweler from a friend of a friend. Then for a while you went to New York, right? You were doing like design. Yeah. So. I went to school at SCAD. If you don't know what SCAD is, it's probably one of the biggest design schools, I think, in the world. They have campuses in France and 
I think they have one in Atlanta now and somewhere else abroad, but I was at the main campus and, and I lived in Savannah. Went to school for motion graphics, went to work in New York after that. I originally thought that like to grow a business, you had to have like a technical skill. For me, that was design, video, motion graphics, and I really excelled at it in school, and I would say even in the workplace I did. I mean, the Game of uh, Game of Thrones season three, like promos I did, worked on some cool stuff, but for me, I realized like, hey, the ceiling is really low, and you have to live in New York or LA, mostly. There's a few other places. But then I realized like, as an artist, and, you know, design and art are two different things. Like, to with design, there's actually rules of design. An artist, you can do anything. But there is a lot of overlap. And, like, let's just look at an artist for, for this instance. If an artist starts getting commissioned and, you know, is uh, solely dependable on clients and clients telling them what to do, a lot of times, like, the artist isn't fulfilled. And I think designers can be the same way. And when I started doing projects outside of school where it's like, here's the boundaries, we can't go outside of this, or your creative director who's not working on the project is saying, no, make it this way. And you're like, but I want it to be like this. It's, it's not as fulfilling. I know a lot of designers who aren't fulfilled and they're just kind of going to autopilot mode. And then on top of that, like, I think what I realized is you don't really need that technical skill that you think you need. For me, it was much bigger than that. And when I look back, I could always sell myself. And if I really believed in something, I could always transfer that belief to someone else. I don't care if it was knocking on doors, mowing people's lawns when I was 12, or taking three months to get hired at Chick-fil-A because I was only 15. I could always set my mark on something and sometimes I wouldn't get it I'm not saying I'm one of those people where like anything I ever just thought was possible happened it Mm -hmm. didn't but I wasn't afraid to go try and be persistent and so in New York I realized okay I need to rethink everything and build a business model in which I'm helping people on long-term goals and selling them on that like Mm -hmm. hey let's not just look at this month or next month or the quarter let's look a year, two years down the road, I'm going to build a plan to get there and then we're going to do it. And then I have a partner for a year or two at least and you're going to pay me on a monthly basis. So I read this book, I think it was like How to Make Money with Social Media. And it's probably extremely basic. It's probably super dated. But at the time it was pitching a partnership with this company HubSpot. This is probably 10 years ago I read this book and it changed everything I was doing because then I, I did just that. I created these long-term partnerships. At the time, I was using HubSpot, and they helped me a lot, actually, because they kind of teach you what to sell. So at the time, it was like, okay, sell these eBooks. Blogs are going to fall off the eBooks. Videos can fall off of those. And back then, like that's how you built authority, ranked on the internet, and were able to get those customers. So that's what we did. We never ran ads until like year two or three. We're like, oh, well, we're making all this content. What if we promoted it? That was the next layer. And then it's like, oh, what if we actually ran offers and direct response? And then we kind of stumbled upon it. Got it. And so you moved back from New York and just started getting like random clients Mm -hmm. in any niche, but local to you guys here in Pensacola, right? Yeah. I mean... We have several of those clients as legacy clients. One uh, writes the rules on how to grade Southern Yellow Pine. Wow. And one of our developers, Zach Gardner, who lives in Arkansas, has built like their entire back end of their business. Wow. So, yeah, it was like anybody and everybody. Like, yeah. I mean, me and Justin built websites for like fishing charters, home builders. (laughs) outdoor fitness boot camps, all kinds of stuff. Wow. And then you stumble (laughs) upon a client that kind of changed things for you, right? And that was a local orthodontist. Yeah. Yeah, even to kind of back up slightly. Yeah. 
when we started to get into healthcare, we met uh, through a friend, somebody who actually came to work for us as like an account manager, a foot and ankle surgeon. Mm. And then we thought, oh, this will be great. We'll just like focus on healthcare. And so he told other people, they told other people, we like got the entire orthopedic group, their friends who they would do surgeries with, like general surgeons, plastic surgeons, then they told people. And then then we started to kind of go to shows and pick up more surgeons or med spas, what have you. I remember one show we went to in Atlanta for plastic surgeons. We still have the client today. And like, as we were packing up and tearing down the booth, like me and another guy we brought in for sales, like left. And Justin was like standing in the ballroom and this guy walked up. He told us later the first marketer he saw he would sign up with because he was like starting his own practice and like was just going to pick one there to sign up with. (laughs) He ended up talking to Justin for like two hours and signed up. He's still a client. Like I said, it was just interesting. But then that's how we thought we would grow is like, oh, we'll go to these random Maybe we'll go to durable medical equipment, their trade show. Maybe we'll go to plastic surgeons. We'll go orthopedist. I don't think we were running any ads to promote ourselves. And then an orthodontist found out about us. And it took about a year to actually do business with them. I remember one time he signed like a website agreement and then the next day like called and asked if we would like tear up the agreement. Went back and forth, several meetings. It was clear that he knew that we were experts and could make a difference, but he was wondering how that would translate to his business. And he mm. already worked with people and you know, had relationships, was loyal to those. And so it took about a year to start getting some projects. And then pretty quickly, I would say within another year, we basically took over all his marketing. Then he started his own course, probably about another year or two later. People come from all over. People come on daily one-on-ones to study his practice. He goes and speaks at industry events. During the past five and a half, six years, he became the fastest growing orthodontist in the country, probably the world. He went from about $2 million in, in production to just shy of 30 million. And so we were part of his story, really no strings attached. Like he would tell a story, he would talk about how his story involved us. He's been very generous to us in that way, you know, and has wanted us to succeed. And the very first event he put on in 2018, we've been to all of them, but the very first one I spoke And I'm like, I'm going to use a different case study instead of his because I don't want people to think like, you know, just that something was going on. Or So Mm -hmm. I use like this nonprofit as like a case study. And looking back on it, it's hilarious. I had no expectations. I'm like, I'm going to speak and there's, you know, a couple orthodontists there and their teams. So there's probably about 60 people. And like four or five people like immediately wanted to sign up. Wow. And for us back then, that was like, you know, uh, a quarter of sales, you know, so like four or five months we did in like a week. And that started to snowball. And then we knocked it out of the park for those people. And he kept having events. And then those people were like, hey, you should go to other events. Or I told my friend about you guys. Or, And then it just grew and grew and grew and grew. Wow. So it wasn't until uh, like 2018, 2019 that you really niched down. Yeah. So I believe in 2019, we officially announced that we were going to niche down. We kept some legacy clients. In 2020, we overhauled our entire brand and website and only have content, only have ads, only have copy um, that speaks to orthodontics. Uh, Now, some other specialties will find out about us and come to us and we only accept people in the dental field and we have just about every specialty there so perio endo prostodontist oral surgery general dentist yeah but i would say 85 percent, 90 percent of our clients are ortho so how many orthodontists do you have now as partners 
About 160. Okay. Yeah, so we've got about 180, 185 total clients. That's going to change because this month was a really big month for us. So pre this month, it was probably about 175. So yeah, it's about 160 orthodontists. Some of those may be uh, ortho and pedo. Mm. Um, but yeah, they're at least orthodontic practices. Got it. And something really unique about you guys is that you sell year long contracts going Mm -hmm. back to what you were saying, like you want long-term relationships with everybody you bring on. Talk to me about what's included in that contract. And then the mindset, I, I think you're really onto something with your sales process when you tell somebody, look, this isn't going to be a quick fix. Mm -hmm. So can you talk about that whole thing and, and how you landed on that and then what it includes? Yeah, it's interesting because there's, there's so many things, not just marketing, but maybe health and the healthcare system or financial education, et cetera, et cetera, where some beliefs and a lot of mainstream beliefs aren't actually true. And Mm. so when somebody comes to a marketing agency and their perception is, hey, like we can get ads on and like in 30 days, this should transform my business. And if it's not a magic bullet, then it's like cancel and on to the next. Mm. That's not actually true. And so if, if it is true and somebody listening has found that, like definitely keep doing what you're doing because like that's a unicorn. And like maybe that can happen, right? But 99.9% of the time, it doesn't. Like any person you look at, whether it be Michael Phelps or Steve Jobs or Warren Buffett, it took a really long time and, you know, hours and 10,000s of hours upon hours to become who they are and hone their craft. And so I always tell people like, hey, you've been in practice for 20 years, the mess that you brought me today and what created 20 years to, you know, blow up and, you know, have create complete disorganization, I can't fix in two months. You know, this is going to be a long process. And, you know, even people who have a pretty good thing going, I talk to them maybe in a different way, but like, you know, we're not going to double your business in 30 days. Like that's impossible. And so I think it's just about educating them on like reality and bringing them back down and letting them know that marketing isn't this superhuman or super business pill that they can swallow, that everything's going to be fixed, right? You look at drugs and things like that, and it's like there's just nothing that does that. And if it does, it's probably not good and it's not going to last. So it's just about resetting expectations and getting them to buy into that. And I mean, we've seen crazy, crazy case studies. We just had one where a guy had 22x ROI, not ROAS, actual ROI in 30 days. Like that's insane. But we don't tell people that that's the expectation. You know, it's it's just about bringing them back down to, to reality. And I think a lot of times people will actually respect that and want to partner with that because then they know they can trust you. I I do think that, in the back of a lot of people's minds, they know that this is BS, but they have to try it because of like the the value that's been oversold. And then they realize it's not true and then it's kind of on to the next, you know? But like, I think when they land on someone who's honest and paints the right picture that they know, okay, like I've been buying the hype and like it's not true and I know it's not been true, but it was like so good that I had to try it. But now I know that I can actually trust this person. Yeah. And you bring them on and it's not just like ads or it's not just SEO, right? Like it's a full framework for them to grow their business. Yeah. Yeah. And for a long time, we wondered if a full framework would, would actually work and be scalable because it's a lot. Like we have a lot of different teams. We have a web design team. We have a development team. We have a partner success team. We have a content team. We have a sales team. Oh, we have a paid media team. A partner success alone is like over all the monthly deliverables. So it's a lot of moving pieces. Our ads team, you know, is split up into a Google ads team and a Facebook and Instagram ads team. 
that may grow as platforms grow. Like I believe TikTok is probably going to be a major player in ads here in the next 12 to 24 months. And so it's a lot to keep up with, but again, it, it kind of goes back to when I talked about omnipresence, like what if one of those channels like isn't significant in a year? Like there's been a lot of questions about some of these platforms and there's been some shady stuff that's happened. People's accounts have disappeared with no explanation, no reason. And so like, do you want to solely rely on one platform or do you want to be everywhere? Yeah. And so, you know, maybe we're not everywhere. We don't do everything, but we do a lot of the core functions that I believe are required to market and grow a business. The other thing that you guys do really well is I think protecting your margins. Obviously mm -hmm. you have a lot of staff to pay, but the price that you charge, what is it and how did you land on, how do you figure out your margins? How do you decide what to charge? Yeah, so there's really only two pricing strategies. You can either be the most expensive or the lowest. You can either be Ritz Carlton or Motel 6, you know, in the middle, it's fine, but the, you can't kind of leverage that. You know, the Four Seasons, like they market their hotel on exclusivity and it's going to be like 10 times more expensive than the other hotel. So we took on more of that approach. Now, I think you have to have the case studies, the team and the service to back that up if you want to charge those types of prices. We did, and the reality is for a long time, like our margins weren't good. We reinvested a ton or we would spend way too long on a client because we wanted to understand and uncover more and knew that was going to be applicable for us down the road. Really, just in 2021, we started to really think and analyze our margins. So somewhere in 2022, we hired a consultant. The one takeaway from that consultant and the relationship was, hey, you need to focus on margins more and you probably need to have some type of finance team because me and Justin actually have a few businesses. And so we have a financial controller and a bookkeeper and we have a report that we analyze and meet on weekly. And it's like every number, every core number that you would want to look at in the business. And part of that is profitability mm -hmm. and really in a service-based type business, you you know, a healthy business would be around 30% margin, give or take. So that was kind of our mark to hit. In retail and food, it's going to be more like 10 to 15. But if you can kind of get over the infancy hump, you're going to want to really look at the numbers and whatever vertical you're in, make sure that your net profit is, is a healthy number for that vertical. Got it. And... Is that how you decided on the pricing was just purely the margins? No, to be honest with you, we kind of like guessed on the pricing. We heard, you know, prices of others. We tried to analyze and look at, you know, okay, what are we going to pay for payroll and these types of things? And then to some degree, it's kind of a, an estimated guess for us and like also based off value. So at any point in time, if I think, if you can't stand behind raising your pricing, then it's probably too high. Yeah. Right. Because like, I believe we could go and raise our prices today and still demand that and still mm. get customers. So we're always under that, you mm. know? Um, so yeah, it was a, it's an educated guess. It's not scientific the way that we built our pricing. So for someone starting out, they want to get into marketing. They want to start an agency in today's climate. Talk to us about what mindset they should go into it with and then how they should spend the first one to two years. The biggest thing I would ask today is how are you going to be different? Because I remember when the digital camera came out, I was like 18-ish. Everybody became a photographer. Photoshop came out. Everybody became a designer. Facebook came out. Everybody became an advertiser. So what are you going to do that's different? You know, if it's the same thing and you have a guarantee or money back and promise you this many leads and blah, 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 like it's there's a billion other people like you and you may be able to do OK, but I don't think you're going to be able to dominate your market. I would really look at like differentiators 
and possibly be completely different than what's out there. And I would really focus more so than marketing, I would focus on the customer experience. Make your customers happy, have a good relationship with them, over communicate, under promise and over deliver. If you do that, it doesn't matter if you can only onboard 10 clients a year, you're gonna keep all those clients. And so, you know, high sales type agencies can only last so long. And I've seen this a hundred times, maybe more, where people will burn down their reputation in the space and have to hop verticals. And you just have a sales agency, like, yeah, you can sell stuff, great job, but you can't keep anybody. And so churn, I think, like I talked about net profit and getting over the infancy stage, I would start to measure churn day one. And if you're churning clients out every 30 days, every quarter, maybe even every six months, I would rethink everything you're doing and at a minimum, do an exit interview with those clients. And I would find out why they're churning. For someone with no skills that wants to get into marketing, what's the best way to learn? Should they get a job first or can they learn, you know, doing free work for clients or cheap work for clients? Yeah, I think they could do either, right? Like YouTube, you know, Facebook has its own course. There's Skillshare, there's Udemy, there's so many. You could buy a course from a marketer who's selling a Facebook course. I really think with that, it depends on the person. Like what I've seen is a lot of people lack the confidence. Confidence is the number one skill, period, for life. If you can't get confidence around what it is you're doing, other people are not going to be confident in you. And so if you have confidence, you can do it on your own, go for it. If you're kind of questioning that, you probably should go work somewhere and set some type of time-based goal. You know, hey, I'm going to work here for a year, two years. I'm going to accomplish these things. I'm going to go through these other courses in my free time, and then I'm going to launch out. Cool. And what about learning the business side of things? As you mentioned, if you just know the ads, yeah, it, it doesn't help that much. Whereas if you yeah. know what levers to pull in your client's business, you can make a massive difference. I think there's a lot of inputs you could study here, podcast books, et cetera. Probably the place that I would start is the E-Myth. It's a book by Michael Gerber. It's probably the best book for young entrepreneurs. I would start there and then obviously dive into podcasts, books, authors, blogs, et cetera. But that alone could be the center point to kind of grasp what it is we're talking about and how to understand business as a whole. Cool. And then when it comes to the specific niche, understanding that vertical, how did you guys go about learning the orthodontic business itself and making sure that you could provide adequate consulting there? Practices we were working with, Fishbine was nice enough to let us come by and hang out the whole day or talk to department heads, just like you're interviewing me, I was interviewing them. Then we started to go to more practices. We would talk to consultants, experts in the space, other vendors or industries that complemented orthodontics and talk to as many people as we could and just then also take our expertise and factor it into that. Yeah. So, Very yeah. Cool. Last question here. What's the outcome that matters the most to you in life? Am I adding value to other people? And am I helping them make the best decisions outside of my own personal gain to elevate them? That's what matters most to me. Cool. Thanks, man. Yep. Appreciate Thanks. it.